Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. The texts for this week are for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on September 8th, 2024. Our first reading is Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 through 7a. Uh, For those following the semi-continuous reading, it will be Proverbs chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, verses 8 and 9, and then verses 22 and 23. Our psalm this week is 146. The epistle is James 2, verses 1 through 10 and 14 through 17, or you can just read chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. And our gospel is the seventh chapter of Mark, verses 24 through 37. Jesus, again, is setting out. And so we set out this week as we begin reflecting on the text. Yeah, another in a string of some very challenging Mark texts between now and November. There's a lot of mm-hmm. a lot in here that requires some study and some nuance mm-hmm. and a little uh, hand wringing. Yeah, and maybe a little uh, maybe a little patience, homiletical patience. I think sometimes with these texts, there's this first reaction of what what on earth am I going to preach? Uh, how am I going to preach this? And uh, and so before before you really get to that, I think you, it, the preacher can just kind of step back and say, uh, you know what? Let's just figure out, or let's just think about what is this? What is this text doing in Mark? What is it? What is it? A, what's happening here? Why? Why this text? Why here? Why now? Uh, what is what is central to this story? Uh, before you know, before you just get all bent out of shape about Jesus or you know, um, <laughs> that and the exchange. Uh, you know, there's so many reactions, and the commentary talks about this. That you know, what to what to do with this kind of Jesus? And um, I don't know. Before you get to all of that, just like let's just take it for what it is right now. And it's a woman who needs to have her daughter healed. And that's what she asks for. And maybe there's something to start there of that, of of that desire or insistence on healing from Jesus that before we even figure out all the other stuff, uh, that's, that's what is, that's, that's what it ends up being about. And then, and then the healing, of course, of the, of the man who is deaf. And so it's, it's, that's the central aspect of this text is healing and the desire to be healed and the, and, and also knowing that Jesus can do that. Yeah. You might even want to start and make a list of the things that you feel pressure to explain Mm -hmm. or to learn for yourself for a passage like this. And again, there's going to be a lot of these. You're going to have to talk about deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You have to talk about the divorce text in Mark 10. You're going to have to talk about if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off so you won't go to hell with you know both your hands. Camel through the eye of a knee. Like you've got a lot of texts. There's going to be a lot of pressure to make them more palatable or make them understandable. Mm-hmm. And there's a place for that. But I would say write all that stuff down and then get a fresh sheet of paper or a fresh screen on your computer and then start digging into some of those questions, Caroline. Like what's this really about? Like what? Or what are the questions that I haven't asked yet that are also Mm -hmm. dreadfully important to making sense Mm -hmm. of this? Mm -hmm. A couple of things I think that are important uh, also, um, I love this idea of of writing all these things out so that you can can almost have them before you go, okay, I know this is here. Um, But this is a place where I think we want to be careful about two things. Uh, One is not to read the text too literally, um, because that always gets us in trouble when we, um, uh, particularly as we get further along and there are some hyperbolic statements, there are some uh, metaphors that are used. And if we get lost in the weeds of whether this is an exact command or if this is uh, to give an idea of the importance or strength of it, um, what we can lose, what you were pointing to, Caroline, is this, why is this there? What are, what are we learning? Why do we need to know these things happen? Uh, the other thing 
uh, that uh, I think is important for us to, to call attention to is really understanding the first century context and really holding to what we want to believe about Jesus. I know that my interpretation of this text is not um, particularly popular, um, so I'm just going to lead with that. Um, but I'm an African American woman in now 2024, and I believe racism and sexism are sin. I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm not going to say that that's somebody's weakness, but um, I'm trying not to be racist and sexist. But if that's your weakness, you go ahead and you be racist and sexist because I'm more worried about the fact that you beat your, you know, your spouse or something like that. No, I'm not going to um, categorize um, what I think is a lack of hospitality and a failure to witness the grace uh, and inclusion and equality of God. And I say all that to say, if Jesus is the sinless embodiment of this gracious, hospitable God, I don't need a God that I have to tell. You do know you created me in your image. You do know that I'm equal. I don't need that kind of God. So, for me, I need to find out what is it that ultimately I'm supposed to get out of this embodiment of God in the person of Jesus that will be written in Hebrews, that will be written in the Revelation, that will be written and passed along where people will say, he is Lord, he is life, he fills me, I can trust him. And if I'm the one, his creation? that needs to tell him how to be God? Honest to goodness, folks, I will hang up my collar and practice the kind of goodness I see in people who don't try to claim that they love this God, but they have to fix him. So I need to get that out there because this is a hard text. And the more I read it in the face of racism and sexism, the harder it is if I make Jesus a 21st century sexist, racist man. Thanks for that, Joy. <laughs> Thanks for letting me go off on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you're just naming, because that's part of the, that's part of the rub, right? Is, uh, it is the, the portrayal of God here or the portrayal of Jesus. And what do we, what do we do with that? I, I want to, uh, and I, and to encourage our preachers to think about that too, um, right. and and to name that for themselves, just as you did. I mean, what is the, you know, I, I say frequently uh, with my students that any text can be difficult if it doesn't agree with you or if it challenges your theology, right? And so, uh, it, for preachers to wrestle with that, uh, I want to go like in a, a little bit different direction, and I uh, and if that's all right, uh, verse twenty nine is I. I, I was struck by that this time around uh, in that G with, with Jesus saying for saying that, and it, for me, it just invited me to think about what would I have said? Uh, how would I have, how would I have responded? What are, what are our words? Uh, and, and, it, the commentary, it is her faithful talk back that moves Jesus. Uh, but, but I'm just, I got to thinking about, yeah, what, what would, for saying that, what would, what would Jesus recognize in what I would say, uh, in terms of expressing my need or expressing, um, my, my, in, or my insistence that Jesus, that Jesus do this and Jesus can do that. So, uh, that was just another direction that I thought, like, what, yeah, what might we say in this situation? What are our words of, uh, what are our words of request for Jesus? What are our words of insistence? Um, if, and especially those times when we feel that our, our prayers aren't being answered or our requests aren't being answered. What, what are our, what are our phrases of insistence and, and, uh, um, and need that we might express? So that's another, that's another kind of homiletical 
homiletical direction. I thought that this text invited me into this time. And that, yeah, and that focuses question focuses the question on what's the story about. Um, the story is not meant to be a deep dive into Christology, I don't think. Uh, it certainly might inform our Christologies, and our Christologies play a part in it, like you were talking about, Joy. But we might be putting too much on the story if we expect this woman who has no name to somehow solve a problem that she might not be asking. You know what I mean? There's a way in which then we miss the healing story and we miss the fact that there's a voiceless, non-present person in this story who's the daughter, who's described as a little girl. And if that's the woman's overriding concern, that says something. It says something about motherhood, says something about being a parent, says something about healing, says something about compassion. And also might remind us that Christology occupies a secondary place in those things. <laughs> we, right. we would much rather talk about Christological controversies in the church mm-hmm. uh, than actually go out and, and heal the sick some some Sundays. Mm. So, uh, and again, I recognize this is a very important person to a lot of people because it's a rare female character who speaks and who stands up and all of those things. So I don't want to dismiss that or diminish her. But I also don't want us to lose sight of the fact that the story begins and ends with a request for a healing mm-hmm. and a discovered healing. And, it, and which goes back to you know how we started our conversation and then also to move on. I mean, it, in, in terms of the healing of the of the deaf man and it. And for me, it ties in well to the Isaiah text. We don't have to go there yet, but. But there's this, uh, the, the insistence on the healing or the begging or the request comes from uh, a, a claim that Isaiah makes, right? That this is what our God, our God can do. Open the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. And so how do, we, uh, how do we preach and talk about a God whose fundamental uh, funda- one of God's fundamental characteristics is a, is healing, uh, and what that and what that means about um, what that means for us to have a God like that and a God in whom we can trust and go to and and make those requests and and beg for that healing. So I that that would be one too, building off of what you said, Matt. Um, to uh, and then potentially to bring in the Isaiah passage. So I I love that uh, f- for two reasons. Uh, the one, um, this is a Gentile woman who seems to be quite aware of what the God of Israel is capable of doing, and is insisting that this God do this for her child. Um, so I, I love that play of, um, this is not a descendant of Abraham and Sarah. This is a Gentile. She's, she's acknowledged, uh, in, in being outside of, of the mark. But the other piece in that, um, every once in a while, you guys will remember that, uh, um, I knew Luke would reference a man and a woman, a named person and an unnamed person. And then Caroline, you taught me to pay attention to reading John that way. After I read about John, uh, uh, Jesus and Nicodemus in John 3, see Jesus and the woman in John 4. This passage in Mark is doing the exact same thing. Jesus is speaking, interacting, healing a person that is a named and unnamed, a person who is present and not present, a person who is female. I mean, it's not just the, the woman that's asking, she's asking for her daughter. And and so to be able to highlight that um, in this passage in Mark, uh, where God is showing up and showing out is crossing those boundary lines that our culture likes to, to make. And um in the healing, the who is being healed and the, their status uh, and their presence or absence uh, before Jesus might be another way to recognize the power of what is being communicated in this text. Yeah, we're pointing out how the man here in the second half of the pericope is often ignored. I, I 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Recently preached on this and just left those verses out entirely. Um, <laughs> in part because I didn't want to have to say ephaphtha in front of people because I've been <laughs> right. I always have to practice that ephaphtha. Be open. Um, practice. But he's an interesting it's going to be a loop on that portion of the tape as everybody <laughs> copies the way you pronounced it. I can't say isthmus either. I always mess that one up. Uh, I have to slow down very much. Anyway, uh, Afafta. Um, when I say is well, I, when I say isthmus, it always brings me back to the the trailer uh, that I had to go to when because I had a lisp when I was in third grade, so I had to or second third grade, so I had to go to the speech. This is why people don't want to read biblical texts in front of the congregation because they get stuck with this. Practice Sally Sell seashells. Anyway, I was going to say something brilliant. I forgot what. No, you you were going to make him a foil. I was listening. You were going to make him a foil. The idea of opening, the idea of opening ears and mouths, which is referred to back in chapter four, when Isaiah's call story is quoted in the midst of the parable of the sower. Mm -hmm. Don't miss that because. The story is about to change when Jesus gets into chapter eight, and it's going to be a lot more focused on Christology and discipleship, those kinds of questions. But one of the frustrations of walking through Mark for seven chapters is, when is this guy going to reveal himself? When is this guy going to make it clear who he is and how come nobody understands him? And here's a place where that, I, you know, symbolically, this opening is really, really important. But then I love it. The more he orders them to tell nobody, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Mm -hmm. There's something going on here about disclosure, that before he's disclosed by words and titles and the cross, he's also being disclosed by these deeds of compassion Mm -hmm. and restoration. And that's part of what revelation is. That's part of what divine disclosure looks like. And so when churches want to talk about how can we don't get noticed or what can we do or how come we don't feel relevant or whatever, those kinds of questions that get asked so much in our age. There's something here about what discloses Jesus, mm-hmm. and it has to do with this the snowballing effect of his real tangible um, deeds of restoration. So just, mm-hmm. to kind of, just to note that the way that, of course, he can't remain secret, even in Tyre, even way out in Tyre, where nobody should know him. There's something about this kind of ministry that's going to always attract folks. But we should move on. Maybe that takes us into Isaiah 35 rather absolutely easily or somewhat seamlessly. He will come and save you. That's a pretty good verse. If you're going to memorize one verse from the Bible. Yeah. 4B. <laughs> Isaiah 35. <laughs> no. But following along with what you're saying, Matt, what does salvation look like? And salvation is in these acts that we've just looked at in Mark, in, in the, that's in the beginning of Mark, that moves along very fast, what that salvation looks like is here and now. It's mm-hmm. not pie in the sky later. Yeah. It's the blind's eyes open. It's the ears of the deaf unstopped. It's the lame able to leap. Um, it's the speechless tongue giving voice. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's water in the wilderness uh, and streams in the desert. This is immediate right now, uh, as I like to say, uh, tomatoes on my table and ham where I am and chicken <laughs> in my kitchen. <laughs> you know, it, it's it, it, When you move into these words of salvation, that are defined in Isaiah, that clearly um, are what Israel has been waiting for. And then it becomes embodied, not in the talk of Jesus, but in the acts of Jesus. And so, Matt, your question is, or, or let me put it as a challenge to the church today, what are we doing that causes people to say, I want some of that? Because we've said a lot of things that people would find encouraging to have, but we've never demonstrated it. But if they saw it, they'd come running. Like deer. <laughs> like the thirsty looking for streams in the desert. Hungry deer looking for your rose bushes. <laughs> Yes. Well, uh, yeah, uh, just a couple comments on that. Uh, One is 
that as I was listening to your um, observations, Joy, you know, that, and of course, Matt, he will come and save you. And then what's the question of what, what does that mean of what salvation is? And I, I think that the salvation really is, you go back further in the verse, here is your God. That's your God is here. And that's yeah. really what, it, what the Mark text gives witness to, right, as well, is that your God is here, your God is, is doing saving things. Uh, and, and, and do we see that? And do we point that out, which then takes me to the psalm? Uh, and then we can go to Proverbs. But for me, that's, that would be the, the role of the psalm this week is, is to this is this these are the words of our response to here is your god because this is what our god does and uh that part of part of uh discipleship or part of following jesus is to is to voice that praise aloud uh and and where it can be heard uh and and recognizing and saying our god is here do you see this god at work um and how is it that we are uh, we are ambassadors of that, or we are witnesses to that and point that out um, for the sake of others. So that's how I would bring the psalm in as well. I want to lean into the psalm, but I want to uh, say one more word about Isaiah. And that is, uh, I've often talked about how um, Ricky Watts talks about how uh, in order to understand the gospel of Mark, you have to understand uh, Isaiah. And in order to understand Isaiah, you have to understand the story of the Exodus, that that for Israel, Isaiah is that big book that is the result of a God who has shown up when they were in captivity. And before the Ten Commandments are given, God shows God's self in God's capacity. God performs what only God can do. And then God starts say, giving these 10 words. Um, and, and when we think about that, what we have, and we've already said this, but what we have in Mark is exactly that embodiment in Jesus. Um, but the other thing that uh, I want to just make sure that we highlight in this psalm that, that you pointed us to, Caroline, is that verse 9, it's not just that God's uh, lifting up those who are bowed down or open in the eyes of the blind, uh, setting prisoners free, but that the Lord is watching over the strangers. The Lord upholds the orphan, the widow, uh, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. And I want to lift that up because I think in our context now, we need to remember that that healing, that attentiveness is to women and children and outcasts, to foreigners and immigrants and strangers, if I use the words of our current culture. And so it's not just the physical medical healing, but it is also the restoration to community of the people who have been forgotten. Yeah, this is nice with the psalm that... <clears throat> in terms of how that might connect to Mark 7. Um, there's a lot going on, I think, in the Syrophoenician woman's short response to Jesus. But one of the things that's going on there is I think she's urging him to see what the psalm says mm -hmm. about the joy that uh, that resides in people who experience God's help. Um, and then, of course, he goes to Gentile lands after that, and we'll end at chapter 8. But goodness, we can't silence the book of Proverbs, can we? We no. So we, we got your one week of Song of Solomon last week, and now you get a couple of weeks couple of weeks. Proverbs, which, you know, it's attributed to Solomon. So, I mean, the, the, the logic of the lectionary here is you get to hear Solomon's voice in Song of Solomon and then in Proverbs. Um, doubtful whether Solomon really wrote all of these, but certainly it's associated with the whole Solomonic notion of, you know, how do you, how do you train young men in their court to be, you know, of good character and make good choices. And so, yeah, and this is interesting that a lot of this is here about uh, dualisms, right? I mean, the if you're going to read Proverbs, you've got to get used to the wise and the foolish and the good and the bad and the, you know, um, and 
And I think it's worth, if you're doing that, it's worth spending some time talking about the rhetorical effect of those dualisms. They're great for teaching and for motivation, for encouraging people to choose this because that way is horrible. Uh, we all know that real life is messier than that, but to talk about what's the rhetorical effect of these dualisms and what danger resides then when we use them as clear maps, right? Where you can stamp wise on one person's forehead and foolish on somebody else's as if there's no uh, distinction there. So to help people get a sense for what's going on and the way these proverbs are meant to work mm -hmm. educationally in terms of moral formation and how that's, there might be limits to that rhetoric and how far it can extend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, it, I think the series on Proverbs could be really interesting at this time of the, of the church year when everybody is, you know, coming back uh, from the summer, uh, you know, rally Sunday or back together Sunday or welcome Sunday or whatever, whatever you, whatever all y'all call it, uh, whatever you want to call it. But nonetheless, I mean, we've got, what is it? It's three or four, three, three um, in Proverbs, four, four coming up, right? Four, three or four. And so that, yeah, oh, so that's me. Uh, yeah, you're holding up three, three. It could be a really interesting, you know, just a mini three part take you into, you know, take you into in September of coming back together and thinking about uh, thinking about this book and particularly the concept of wisdom uh, and what how do we how do we cast wisdom theologically uh, mm -hmm. um, and what does what does the role of wisdom have in and how we imagine who God is and also how we imagine uh, being you know being being disciples and being people mm -hmm. of faith um, I think it could be a really interesting and and helpful uh, theme for people um, marching into the fall and the election, at least in the States. And so, yeah. It lets you sneak away from Mark seven and James two also. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> we should get to James here. Moving right along. We're in our second week of James. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 many ways, the first of this particular verse is exactly what we've already talked about in the other verses in terms of uh, to whom are our acts, in this case of favoritism, um, do we do them believing in God? Do we do them believing in, in, the, in glorifying God? Um, or are we doing it because, um, to think back to the Proverbs, you know, having a good name, are we doing it because it's, we think this person is important? Uh, are we looking at this person's outward appearance and trying to saddle up beside them? Uh, and I think that uh, this is this is almost a counter word uh, that uh, underscores what we've just said in Mark, uh, that uh, the named person, the unnamed person, the outcast person, uh, the male, the female, the present, the not present. Um, our actions, are they really pointing to the glory of God or are they trying to get us favor among humanity? Yeah, the um, <clears throat> it's just a brutal passage <laughs> because it, it's just so real. You know, it's mm -hmm. it, as it talks about favoritism or partiality, but then how it illustrates exactly what that looks like. Um, I love what the, the NRSV updated edition uh, does verse one in a way that I think is really helpful, at least to me. My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory while showing partiality. That idea of claiming the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ is interesting because it's, I, I think faith in James is is more about kind of affiliation with Jesus, like to claim a kind of allegiance with Jesus, like so in other words, like how dare you imagine yourself to be right on Jesus's side or one of Jesus's people while showing preference for the powerful and the wealthy? I mean, what almost as if like, how could you get it so wrong? Like, how could you invert the pattern of Jesus so wrong? And so the idea of like who gets to sit where, uh, people being dragged into court, people who abuse the legal system because of their power. Chapter five is going to talk about people who aren't paying their workers fair wages. You know, it's, there's, 
there's real stuff in here that it doesn't require a lot of imagination to see where that exists in our own culture and our own lives and our own preferences to how we circulate in the world. Um, finding good news in here is the challenge, right? But it's also, there's this direct statement in verse five that God has chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith. I mean, there's, you can't get a clearer statement of, of, uh, of what James is at or a clearer statement about whose side God is on. And again, I don't want to mm -hmm. overdraw that binary mm -hmm. image of God can only be on one side, but, but I also don't want to dismiss James as, you know, as uh, hyperbole. Right. Right. The, the interesting thing I like to, to always remember is, uh, the words of James sound a whole lot like the words of Jesus. And I wish we read James in the year of Matthew, um, because you you kind of see that starkness, that bluntness. Um, and I think it's because their mom taught them the same kinds of wisdom. Um, I'm just saying, you know, but it it's it's really, you know, we think of the prophets, particularly the minor prophets, as speaking those harsh words, and we forget that in the first century, and maybe in the 21st century, we need to hear those harsh words again, because we found our favor in God, and we forget that we are to be the blessing to others that we have experienced in God. And I think that's what James is saying. And maybe this year, maybe the harder word would be to spend the week's preaching through the Epistle of James this year. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.